Good morning. We'd like to welcome everyone to the Mesa City Council study session for the morning of Thursday, March 23rd. All of our council is present. Uh, the first item on our agenda today is uh, a presentation and to provide funding recommendations for community development block grants, also known as CDBG grants, home investment <laughs> partnership, emergency solution grants, and human service programs. It's good to have you folks with us, thank you. I know a lot of uh, effort has gone into this uh, with a lot of people to get it to this point. So we appreciate everyone who's been involved to this point and look forward to continuing the process. Thank you very much. M Michelle Albanese, thank you. Take it away. Good morning, Mayor Giles, Vice Mayor Heredia, City Council. Thank you for the opportunity to present to you today. I will be providing an overview of the annual funding process for allocating both federal and local resources and reviewing the housing and community development funding recommendations for fiscal year 23-24. The federal sources include community development block grant program, home investment partnership program, emergency solutions grant, and then we do have local funds that the city contributes which is a combination of general funds and donations through a Better Community or ABC Utility Donation Program. Today, staff will be requesting City Council review, discuss and approve the recommended funding allocations for both critical programs and services. And then the HUD Annual Action Plan, which will outline these funding recommendations, will then be um, presented on the Council Consent Agenda on May 1st. And then the plan is due to HUD May 15th. Just to give you a little bit of background in my presentation, um, I'll be covering the HUD funds, which are entitlement funds, which I'll cover in just a moment. Um, briefly, how our annual funding process works, the role of the Housing and Community Development Advisory Board in the funding process, and then finally, the recommendations. The Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, awards federal grants annually to entitlement communities. And what that means is any city with a population over 500,000, I'm sorry, over 50,000. And that's to carry out a wide range of community development activities. And those are always directed towards either revitalizing neighborhoods, improving community facilities, and providing critical services to the community. Grants are allocated to cities on a formula basis, and this formula is a combination of pop, uh, population and poverty. It also considers the community needs, the uh, extent of poverty, population, age of housing, and housing overcrowding. And so with these funds, cities can utilize their entire allocation for activities um, for their core city programs, as well as if they'd like to allocate a portion of funds to nonprofit agencies to deliver services into the community. And the city of Mesa is committed to funding both the core city programs and services, as well as providing funds to our partnering agencies. These programs will assist low and moderate income folks, um, Mesa residents by providing critical basic needs and addressing homelessness, as well as access to housing, education, job training, housing rehabilitation programs, and facility improvements. So when we um, allocate funding to the nonprofit agencies, we do have an annual funding process, and those applications are solicited through a competitive process. They are reviewed, evaluated, and scored by the City Council appointed Housing and Community Development Advisory Board, as well as staff, which I'll get into in a little bit more detail. And um, Mayor Council, I know you're all very familiar with our housing path to recovery. Um, we do have a significant portion of the housing and community development dollars that go to fund programs and services related to addressing homelessness. And these funding recommendations are for programs and services that align with Mesa's strategic plan for addressing homelessness. The city helps to facilitate local collaboration with agencies and determines um, priorities for the distribution of funding. Um, along this path of recovery, which includes homeless response and prevention, 
vital human services and community needs, as well as access to affordable housing, continued education and job training, and also public facility improvements. Just wanted to point out just a few dates that are um, very key in our funding process. So our process does start typically in September and ends in May, so it's a quite lengthy process. Um, but wanted to specifically point out these dates. So our process began October 22nd, or October of 22 on October 3rd with an applicant orientation for the nonprofit agencies and the departments of City of Mesa. And the purpose of the orientation each year is to discuss the sources of funding and anticipated amounts available, as well as to really explain the process to apply, the deadline for applying for funds, identifying key dates and explain eligibility and regulatory requirements. We also explain to the agencies each year those strategic goals and priorities, and those are based on the city council strategic priorities. Any unmet needs or gaps in service that we identify in the community, and I know we've had a lot of conversation about some of those unmet needs on the housing path to recovery. We discuss the scoring and how that is done in a combination of the Housing Community Development Advisory Board and staff scores. And also identifying what's the best funding source for that agency to apply for, depending on their activity and the size of their agency. Um, staff do dedicate a significant amount of time to provide technical assistance to the agencies and to support the applicants through the application process, but specifically during that two-week period between the applicant orientation and when the applications are due. Um, we had a couple of workshops that we hosted, so it was kind of a drop-in if the agencies wanted to come and get information, as well as staff scheduling individual meetings to really go over their individual activity, how to fill out the application, and any concerns they might have with the proposal. Just to give you a little quick background on the Housing Community Development Advisory Board that participates in this process. They are an 11 member board. They are appointed by City Council to advise on priorities, funding and planning for housing, community development and social service programs, as well as giving input on plans such as the um, city's general plan and balanced housing plan that we're currently working on. But primarily, the main responsibility of this board is to participate in the annual funding process, which is September, really through March, is their participation. The board's um, role in the funding process, they are dedicated to a significant amount of time of reviewing each and every agency's application for funding. They hear agency presentations over a very long two-day period, um, and they have the opportunity to ask follow-up questions for the agencies on the proposed applications, and then ultimately they score the applications. And in scoring those applications, the board considers the type of activity, um, the need for the service in the community, the number of persons um, and targeted population to be served, as well as their proposed budget and any leveraged funding and the agency's capacity to deliver the service. And then as far as the evaluation and award process, after the applications um, are submitted, staff does a complete and thorough review for um, the application to make sure that everything that's required to be supplied and submitted has been and they begin evaluating for eligibility for each funding source. And we are required to complete a HUD eligibility determination form for any federally funded program. So it goes over if they meet the regulations and any concerns. I mean, just wanted to touch really quickly at the December 6th and 7th meeting where the agencies presented to the Housing and Community Development Advisory Board. Um, agencies were notified of kind of the criteria for those presentations. Each agency were given the same amount of time to present. And we asked that they include information such as their program goals and outcomes um, regarding the specific activity they're requesting, the number of residents to be served, um, if they have any matched or leveraged funds, as well as how the agency um, intends to collaborate with other resources and agencies in the community. So 
now we'll get into the actual meat and potatoes of the um, funding. So what I have on the screen for you here is the federal dollars. Um, so our annual award for CDBG is just over 4 million. For home, it's 1.6 and ESG is 367,000. In addition to that, for CDBG, we do have some reprogram dollars of 2 million. Um, and so we have requests for over 1.7 million just in our public services area. And just wanna remind the council that um, for public services, we can only spend a maximum of 15% of our current allocation. So not any reprogrammed funds, just the current allocation, which is 607,000. About what those are? Absolutely. So reprogrammed funds, if an agency didn't fully expend dollars the year before, or if the project was funded, but after working with the agency, it was determined that it was not a feasible project, um, then th those funds would be reallocated, reprogrammed into the next process. For our non-public service projects, which are our bricks and mortars, um, it's gonna be our housing rehab programs, any type of facility improvement, we have 4.6 million available um, with $7.9 million in requests. For home, we have just over 1.6 million. We do have another million that we can reprogram, so 2.3 million available with 3.5 million in requests. And last, for ESG, we have 367,000, which is our allocation request of 507,000. And important to point out here for ESG, we can only spend a maximum of 60% of the allocation on shelter services. So when we have the applications, we make sure that we're not going over that cap. So what we have on the screen here now is our um, recommended Funding allocations for CDBG public services, again, 15% of our total allocation. So we have $629,000 available. Um, we are recommending nine programs to be uh, awarded funds. And if there's any particular one you'd like me to go through, um, I will just identify that all of the services here um, provide programs and services to address homelessness in one respect or another. Um, even though some of them aren't directly for youth, we do have some that serve families, which often include youth, but there also are um, specific populations such as men's shelter and um, domestic violence. So we'll move on to the CDBG non-public services. In this category, we have um, $4.4 million, and we are recommending five projects. Um, these are, again, more the bricks and mortar projects. They can be facility improvements as well as housing. So these projects are very risky, very difficult to administer, and they take anywhere from 18 months to three years to complete. And so we wanna make sure when we're funding these projects that both the agency and staff are aware and comfortable that they can meet the regulatory requirements and the projects really need to be shovel ready. Um, and this is where we also provide funding to our core programs that I mentioned um, that the funds are originally intended for. So on this screen, we are recommending um, funding our housing rehabilitation program, which is one of our core programs and two of the parks for um, playground installation or replacement and assisting with um, a portion of a complete facility improvement um, for CAS for specifically to seniors. Get in. I did not. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> I was trying to make eye contact with everybody. <laughs> I'm a senior too now. No question. <laughs> okay, we'll move into home. Um, recommending four projects totaling uh, 2.3 million, which would utilize the, all the funding here. Um, these home funds complement and support other programs by providing housing opportunities for Mesa residents. 
The majority of the funding in this category goes for tenant-based rental assistance, which is similar to a voucher program, but it's more of a temporary two-year transitional housing. Um, we also have a tenant rental assistance program that solely provides utility and rent deposit. We also have one project um, for construction at La Mesita, which is their last phase there. Um, and this is contingent on a successful application for low income housing tax credits. We'll move into the emergency solutions grant, ESG. Um, this pot of money can solely be used for addressing homelessness in four specific categories. We have two applications that are for um, homeless services, and that's our 60% cap. And then we have one application for rapid rehousing, so recommending the full award for these three projects. And we'll move into our human services funding, and I wanted to separate this from the federal dollars because it doesn't have the same restrictions and requirements, um, you know, and eligibility requirements that all of the federal sources have. The city provides funding for human service programs, and that's through local funds, um, through our general fund contribution, as well as through ABC, or A Better Community, which is the utility donation program. And these programs primarily serve um, crisis, access to basic needs, emergency shelter and food, as well as um, job development. <coughs> So what we have on the slide here is general fund contribution is 412,000, ABC is 146,000, and so we have a human services available funds of 558,000 for programs and services. This slide I think is really important to point out um, the contribution that the city makes out of general funds, not just for the 558 we just discussed for programs and services, but also um, we do provide funding for three contracted community court navigators. That's $204,000 for a committed five years. We also fund the Mesa College Promise program at $100,000 for five years. Astra Aging con contribution to utilities of $96,000 for operations at the Senior Center. And then we do have um, a set aside for a HUD reallocation for some funds that are being repaid back. Um, but just wanted to point out that the majority of the funding here goes to the human service programs we just discussed. Okay, so we'll go through the last funding um, recommendations, which are the human services ABC program. As everyone's aware, we always get many, many applications in this funding source with probably the least amount available dollars. Um, so it's very challenging, very competitive. We received over 30 applications um, in this category, requesting over $1.8 million, and we're recommending 15 programs to be funded for 558,000. We do make sure that the priorities that are identified, which include homeless and crisis needs, food and basic needs, youth services and education, health services, workforce development, and then tax and legal, that those are all represented when we do our funding recommendations. So you can go to the next slide, Justin, you got that, okay. Um, and then the last piece is the next step for city council and for our plan. So April 1st, we'll begin our 30-day public comment period. So we have an annual plan we have to prepare for HUD, which includes the funding recommendations, but quite a bit more information that HUD requires. And then May 1st, the annual plan and recommendations are um, going to be taken to city council for final approval, and the plan would be submitted by May 15th. That concludes my presentation. And if Thank you very much. Uh, can you go back to the last slide just uh, the, for one moment uh, with the timing? So uh, we really need to do to have all the dust settled on this by May the 1st so that we can meet the HUD deadline of May the 15th. Or can we like move this if needed? And, and to, for things to happen on May 1st, they really have to happen on April 1st because we have to have a 30-day comment period. Is that generally correct? 
Generally correct, yes. Okay. Yeah. So if we wanted, it, uh, so we have the rest of March to chew on this. Uh, and if need be, we could move the, the May 1st uh, meeting back a week or so, but we still want to give ourselves, you know, we don't want to be doing this on the morning of May the 15th. Correct. Okay. Correct. All right. Thank you. I know there's, there's plenty of questions. Who would like to begin? Ms. Spilsbury. Hi, thank you so much. I know that there is so, so, so much work that goes into this for months and um, I, I just want to acknowledge that and thank you and, and the board for all of your work on this. And also just in the last week, um, I'm the new chair of the CCD Council Committee and we had our meeting last week and so we went over last week, two weeks ago. <laughs> calendar I don't know um, but after we went over that and I looked at all the recommendations and asked a billion questions um, since that meeting I've taken a little bit more time to look through a lot of these recommendations and ask even more questions and meet with you um, and so I just wanted to um, under the CDBG public services um, as I looked through those they're all for homeless um, the one organization that did not get funded was Child Crisis because the I have the list that shows the ones that didn't get funded. I think you guys all do too. Correct. That is correct. Yeah. So Save the Family wasn't eligible. So Child Crisis is the only organization that didn't get funded on this category. And when I was looking through it, I noticed that their project specifically targets the youth coming out of foster care girls, which is a huge priority of mine and a passion of mine. I've brought it up several times over the last couple of years. Um, I was just a little bit sad to see that something that's so important to me wasn't funded. And when I've dug into the reasons why they weren't funded, I'm not coming up with substantial answers on that. So I would just like to propose that we try to do some funding for child crisis to target the youth because it, the way I look at it, it's so important to target an 18 year old before they enter the world of chronic homelessness and when they're in such a vulnerable position. And it makes me sad to see that they're not getting any funding for an, a program that's so important. Um, I did wanna ask though, um, so they asked for 500,000 for this project with a total amount of 630,000, obviously they're not gonna get 500. Um, and I'm not sure what amount is beneficial to child crisis. So before we maybe have a discussion about where we could come up with funding or how we could fund them, I wanna maybe find out from child crisis what would be beneficial to them. Does that, does that make sense? So obviously I see Tori on the front row. Are, are you asking? I'm asking if Tori would come up and before we begin this conversation to, to know if, if there's a dollar amount that would be beneficial to you because it's obviously not gonna be funded at 500,000. Okay. Does that make sense? Sure, Tori, if Tori's, uh, thank you for <laughs> being available. Thank you Tori. for being here, Tori. <clears throat> Good morning, Mayor and Council, and thank you for the question, um, Mayor Spilsbury. So uh, yes, uh, we would love to continue to expand um, homeless services for the youth in the foster care system. And this specific uh, request was for $500,000. As many of you know, we're continuing to expand homeless services for youth and children, and this is a new group home and shelter that we have purchased and we would really um, love to have the full support of the 500,000. While I recognize in this category, um, those funds aren't there, um, I would ask that the council and the committee and um, staff help us find a way to put the puzzle pieces back together so that we can continue to expand. Uh, we have expanded and this was part of the whole goal of the expansion campaign with the beautiful um, property that will be soon up on Rio Salado and Country Club. And so we've been talking about this for about six years now and we've been coming back um, each and every year and I understand the priorities change and um, the council members change and the staff changes, but 
We're still here and we're still doing the work for 45 years at Child Crisis Arizona. We wanna to continue to serve children and youth and families. So I, I know this is longer than probably what you wanted to hear, but I would just ask the council to relook at all those categories. Michelle did such a great job of putting those puzzle pieces together. And um, we, are in process of building that building, but part of the expansion campaign was to expand services to the children in the um, the children who needed um, early education services, and to all of the foster children in Arizona needing shelter services and slash group homes. There's nowhere else for these children to go. They are going to be in shelters or group homes because um, most of them are not going to be fostered or adopted. And so they will remain with us at Child Crisis Arizona. This is why we needed to expand this campus. And so this project is kind of a continuum of the building that we're building. And so if the building didn't get on the cut for one of the categories, this one would be very helpful to have the full funding in place. But I do um, ask that uh, the mayor and council and committee can go back and I know it's been done in the past. Many times I've been at this table and you know I have friends and family here and the council and the staff have been amazing at figuring out the puzzle. So thank you. I would like all of the 500,000 <laughs> in some way, <laughs> shape or form. Three minutes. Is that three minutes? Oh, was that yours? <laughs> was that yours? No. We, had a, we had a timer go know off and we don't know. That's okay. <laughs> Someone needs to take their medicine. Hopefully that helps. <clears throat> <laughs> we like to break the tension every once in a while. Um, yeah, I don't know if that helps or not because I don't think there is 500,000 available there. So I don't, I, I have some ideas and okay. suggestions, but I kind of okay. wanted to hear what my colleagues were feeling about this before we move forward. Okay. I just have a quick question, if that's okay. Any uh, other questions so, for Tori? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The, so you're saying this 500,000 is, is to go to the new home that is to be built? The home is already built. It's a home okay. in Mesa that there. we've purchased. Okay. And so the half a million dollars is to support the ramp up services. So we can, we okay. have not yet been able to start with those 10 homeless youth, teen girls in the home yet. We would like some funding in order to expand and to do that. We are unable to do it. It's sitting empty at this point. I, I do have a couple of questions. So if there's funding available for in the um, public services, which is the, the money's going to personnel, right? Yes. And is it dependent on getting funding also in the non-public services, which is equipping the kitchen primarily? There's some personnel things. I mean, if we fund one mm -hmm. and the other isn't able to complete the building or the you know, facilities, are you able to use one without the other being funded? We can absolutely use one category instead of all four. And so um, any combination would be wonderful for us. Um, as you know, we are building this building. It's a $25 million project. We've been talking about it, and um, the city staff and council and prior council have been very supportive. We are $17 million on our way to the $25 million. We have told all $17 million um, contributors and supporters that the city of Mesa is behind this building. So whether it's the $500,000 we have asked for for the kitchen appliances, or 500,000 for the expansion, I have to be able to go back to my supporters and say that the city of Mesa is supportive of this project. That has been there since the beginning, since Mayor was at our um, ceremonial groundbreaking, and then we had our, um, we well, we had our ground dedication, and then we had our groundbreaking, and so uh, we, I need to be able to go back and show that the city of Mesa is supportive of this project because so many funders wanted to use that as leverage. And so um, we've been talking about it and I've been saying this and so I, I'm really asking the city out of the $25 million, we have asked for 1.2 million this year in four different categories and I'm 
open to taking um, the support in any of the categories or a combination. And in the past, the city staff has been so good about um, being able to move things around in the different categories that would fit. And so I'm asking you to ask the city staff to work with us to be able to figure out a way to do that so that we can go back, support the expansion project um, in the different categories. And so I know that's a long answer, but we really do need some significant dollars um, this year to continue to do all of the early education and the shelter services and the growth that we have promised so many people. Can, can I just ask one more question about that? So um, your request for public services, which is the personnel of 500,000, is you know the largest uh, request as far as um, the ones that we have on our immediate sheet. Um, so 500000 is that for a one-year funding? How long does that last? A one-time funding, and that will help us with the project that we are building, and that will be specifically carved out for this um, kitchen area in or the just new building. That one's the non-public one. The 500 is not the kitchen one. Public services is not the kitchen, but the, for the personnel. For the, for the teen group home. Yeah. Yes, so, one time teen group home, yeah. 500,000. So 500,000 for personnel services yeah, the, the to run the group home, and Correct. that is for a one year duration. Correct. And that's an aggressive number, and I'm not trying to criticize, I'm just saying the next year, if you don't have the funding, can you sustain the personnel and those services? Absolutely. We have contracts with the Department of Child Safety, with the Tribal Social Services, multiple. We will be able to help fund and offset the annual, um, the annual cost and operations of that 10-bed uh, teen group home for homeless youth who, if they aren't going to be served by us, they will end up in the domestic violence shelters, in the homeless shelters. We need to catch them before they're 18. And so we had to purchase this property for half a million dollars and do the ramp up to get the staff and the renovations needed in order to do the services. So this is a one-time request for the girls group home for those 10 teens. Yeah, I agree on, on the cause, absolutely. So um, last year, you were granted dollars in this category, and I don't have my notes as far as what that was for. Has, was that totally expended? They were in 22-23, but in 21-22 they were. Yeah, last year. Well, this is, so, so we're in the 23-24 cycle right now. Mm -hmm. So last year was the 22-23 cycle, and they weren't given any funds in that category. Oh, okay. You're prior. I, I, so okay, then the 21-22. 21-22 is what I'm referring to. Yes. And so when we um, come to the city and we write our proposals, typically our, um, our federal, state, and city contracts will pay for about 50% of the cost that it will cost the agency to run that service or program. And so we will fundraise um, the rest. And so those dollars were used for the year that we asked for them in. And we had to match whatever that 50% was from federal, state, and city by philanthropic dollars. So in 21-22, the funds that were awarded through this category, CDGB Public Services, was totally expended. Yes. Except for $9,000. Okay. <laughs> she sent me this information. Oh, okay. Because okay. <laughs> that was one of my questions that I had. Can I, can I jump in real quick? I, um, I have too many questions. But I, I did want to just point out I've um, I've heard that we have to go by the scoring because that's the rubric, and so you guys scored the lowest in this category, and that's why you weren't funded. So I wanted to know why you were scored so low. And the two um, the two comments that I was given was the that they didn't expend all of their money, and that the project wasn't wasn't talked about in the presentation. Were the two reasons that I've been given. I haven't seen the scoring rubric. So the, the four of the projects on here, the money wasn't expended, and I got those numbers from Michelle, and they were the lowest by far that wasn't expended. One of the projects, one of the organizations didn't expend $75,000, right? And they only didn't expend 9,200. Right, and typically I feel like sometimes um, we have to keep, you know, 
really good track and all the other CFOs in the room understand we have to keep time cards and when we say it's for this staff or this exact thing and then they might work in a different program and so sometimes some it's really difficult to draw down and if that specific staff if we have a name by it I don't recall what the nine thousand dollars was but I, I would like to apologize um, because we brought the former city manager to help us with our presentation um, for the committee. And um, he really talked a lot about the history, the 45 years ago and Mr. Luster and God bless him and may he rest in peace and we've got a plaque over there at the shelter. And I think for the presentation, he got really excited and he talked a lot about Mr. Luster and the importance of this City of Mesa sponsored huge nonprofit. We're $36 million a year. We have 400 employees here. And he really talked about that instead of answering the questions that we had already provided in the application. So the committee did have all the correct answers, but in the presentation itself, I apologize that the three minutes that was utilized, probably a minute and a half, was used on the history of Child Crisis Arizona, how it began, how it got started, how the city staff and the city council at the time was so supportive of it. And I know that's why we ranked very low. And so I, I apologize that that happened. I will do the presentations myself in the future. <laughs> Lesson learned. And I'm an A student, and so that's really hard to hear that we well, got the and I just, score. Well, I wanted to bring it up because to me, if we're going to go by scoring, I want there to be valid reasons. And, and to me, those seem way too subjective and not objective. But Michelle, you seem like you want to add something well, to that. Before <laughs> we do that, do we have any more? I'd like to excuse Tori if we're done with questions uh, well, Tori. Well, so I, do, I have one more question. And I'm guessing you can answer this, but maybe some. This is in, a question for Tori. Yes. Okay. In 2018, I watched the study session because I've been kind of trying to figure out the history here. and. Um, in that meeting in March of 2018, it was proposed that we would pay for the downtown facade instead of funding you at that time, and that later that year it was going to be 500000 And I cannot find if you guys were awarded 500000 in 2018. Is this a que uh, so question? So, Michelle, question for my opening up a can of worms. I'm just this trying. Is a, this is a, I'm going to excuse Tori. Okay, okay. So that's what right. I was just trying thank to figure out. Thank you very much, Tori. Thank you so thank much you for much. all the time today. I really appreciate <laughs> it. Welcome. And uh, thank, thank you. you. So, uh, Michelle, can you give us a history of the funding of child crisis over the last few years? I know we've we've attempted to fund the child crisis over the last few years. We do endorse, you know, the the mission and the and the, the expansion. I understand we've had problems with meeting HUD eligibility. Can you give us a brief history on that? Yes, certainly. Um, Mayor Giles, uh, Council Member Heredia, and uh, Council Members. Um, so I wasn't here in 2018, but I'm pretty familiar with the process. There have been several applications over the last couple of years um, for the new construction of the facility that Tori mentioned um, off of Rio Salado and uh, Country Club. At the time for 2018, I believe the $500,000 um, was for the acquisition of property for a particular location. Um, what the problem was is that the additional funding to construct the facility had not been raised yet and would take fi approximately five years um, based on my conversations with Child Crisis. And so at the time, if you go into contract and purchase land and sit on it for five years, it's considered land banking, which is in violation of the regulation. So that's why it wasn't funded at that time. Um, and some other applications after that, it was based on timing and, and total funding. So um, while they may have been awarded through the process, no contracts had ever been executed for the project. Okay, and that's for the new building. Correct. And then I also, if I could, um, Mayor, I just wanted to uh, further explain the process for the scoring because a lot goes into that. Um, and so after the agency presentations, which again have specific criteria that they're asking for, even though it's included in the application, um, the board and staff score the application separately. So we have right now nine out of the 11 members scored each application individually. We then um, use their scores as an average Staff also score the applications based on eligibility, how they're going to meet federal requirements, staff capacity, past performance. So there's a little different criteria. 
we take the board score and the staff score and put it together. And then when we're doing these recommendations, they are ranked by score. And then we begin doing the allocations um, in proportion to what those scores are. So there is a lot that goes into that scoring. And so I know there were just a couple comments that we <coughs> talked about, um, Council Member Spillsbury, with that particular agency. But there's, there's more that goes into that process. And I assume there's much more that goes into the process, obviously. But if those are the two reasons that I'm going to be told, then those must be the two biggest reasons. Or else there would be other reasons that would be told to me. So it's not necessary that those are just the two reasons. Those are additional staff notes we put on there. Um, I can say that you know the board scores can be lower too, uh, which makes the average come down. So it's not just the staff scoring. And we don't highlight what made the other proposals better. Right. We, we only focus on the comments that suggest there was something lacking. What we're not seeing is the presentations. Each, uh, I think the value of why we use these boards is because they are willing to volunteer and spend two days interviewing and receiving presentations. And so they not only score on the demerits, but they also score on what they see as, you know, the, the value of each of the proposals and then rank them that way too. Well, and <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm kind of getting into the weeds on this, but I'm really trying to just make a point here. Um, and you know, I'm all about objectivity and subjectivity. You guys know this, zoning knows this, this is all I talk about. Um, I, <clears throat> in, in asking and digging deep on how it's scored, the board, the nine members of the board, make up 25 points. And then the two staff members, because I know it's four staff members total, but you told me two grade 30 projects and two grade another 30 projects. So the two staff members are responsible for 70 points. So again, that was just interesting to me to see that nine people are are going towards the 25 points and two people are going for 70 points. So again, I just think this is all a little bit interesting and maybe a little bit more subjective. <laughs> well, but, then each, but the ranking then is presented back to the board for them to see even with the, so I guess I'm gonna take a little bit of caution about suggesting that staff is doing a subjective evaluation. They're doing a technical evaluation. Well, they have evaluation. seven questions and doing a criteria. I know, but I, it's, when it's we say detailed. subjective, it suggests that there is something the count, that the staff is looking at that is not transparent. And I, we've really tried hard to maintain the, tegr the integrity of this process. Yeah, and I'm not suggesting it's not transparent or that well, anyone. Subjectivity suggests that there's something. That there's that just some emotion and feeling involved, that it's not like make a basket and there's your two points. There's, there's a lot more that goes into the decision. That's all I'm suggesting. I'll, I'll stop talking and let some other council members talk. Okay, I know we do have some other questions. Mr. Freeman and then Mr. Aredia. You know, it's hard to follow Julie. I'm sorry. You know, <laughs> she has such a passion. I do. But I, do. but I want to thank you know our advisory board. You know, going through this review process, it's extremely time consuming, and to, to review all the applications. <clears throat> and I do know that there's so many guidelines and regulations that affect everything that we're considering today. Some time ago, we had a federal audit. And I want to go back to that federal audit that we had. And it placed us kind of on the red flag list that we had to comply with certain components during that audit. And I want to, does what we're considering today, what service would that fall into? Is it all of the ones that we're considering or just one particular one? So about the audit itself. And are we compliant with the audit today? <clears throat> uh, Mayor Giles. I don't want to pick the scab off, but I, well, I think we should have the discussion. It's relevant because we are having to pay $100,000 a year because right. we did not comply with the HUD requirement. Now, Michelle's been deep into this co consequence, so I don't remember what that, all the details of why we're doing that. So maybe you want to give some Absolutely. background on that. And all this happened while Michelle wasn't here. She's been trying to get us out of this. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, Yes, we are now compliant with that particular audit, council member, that you are speaking about. Um, and we were able to successfully get the money down that we had to pay back. Um, but as part of that, there are several uh, requirements that HUD has imposed. And one is 
what I mentioned earlier about the HUD required eligibility determination form, which has to be filled out for each and every agency who's applying for CDBG home or ESG. And it's about a four page document that asks about the uh, description of the service, if it meets a national objective, and if so, which one? Is it in a low mod census track? Um, does it meet a, an eligible activity? Are there any regulatory concerns? And I will say that last year, when we went through this process, afterwards they asked for us to submit the technical review. So as part of the audit, there has been follow-up to ensure that is City of Mesa doing what they said they would do to get out of the audit? And, and we did, we did last year, so that's good. Um, Michelle, but, is any of that technical review, is that part of the evaluation of these of these projects when you're doing that? Yes, thank you, Chris, it is. So that is also a piece that the eligibility is completed and then when score the scores are done by the staff, on those questions, those are things that we're taking into consideration. The agency's capacity to comply with the federal regulations and the federal regulations for the public service is a lot less challenging than the other ones that we talked about where they're doing the bricks and mortar, because there's also what we call cross-cutting regulations. So we've got Davis-Bacon where we have to pay the, the fair wages. Um, we've got um, minority and business enterprise outreach. We've got a bunch of other regulations they have to comply with. So I hope that answers your question, council member. It does. I'm, I'm just trying to make sure that when we, we're walking a fine line here, even though we've had the audit review from the feds and being compliant with that. I just want to make sure that if we're considering moving monies around for an organization that we're in compliance with that. And I have some hesitancy to do that because I'd rather us stay in compliant and not have to um, jump for some more hoops here in the future. But I'm still open and kind of riding the fence line. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reddy. Well, I guess uh, I had a previous question, but uh, on this question, on this topic, if uh, if an agency is deemed not eligible, are they told they can't apply uh, to the process uh, of uh, any of these four buckets uh, prior hand, or once they submit, um, are they told that they're not eligible? So for the for the organizations that were considering funding. Um, we, didn't, uh, we don't consider them uh, eligible for those uh, pots of monies. That's my first question. It's a very good question, um, Mayor and Vice Mayor. Uh, so it depends on at what point in the process. So if somebody comes to us before the applications are due and explain we want CDBG money for this project and we can clearly identify that that is not an eligible activity under CDBG, then we would deem it not eligible and they most likely wouldn't apply. There are other instances when we talk with agencies during that time and generally that activity itself is eligible. However, we can't make that complete determination until we've reviewed the application and all of the criteria in it. So there may be some applications that get to this process that after we've determined it's either not feasible or very risky or ineligible. But those are then noted in the funding recommendations that they're either not eligible or they're eligible so they they continue to be scored in the process, right? So what we got here and what CCD uh, asked uh, or was asked to, to review, those organizations were eligible at that time, right, to get, get funding. Uh, just to clarify, the, the current applications that weren't labeled as not eligible oh, sure. to, yeah. uh, to make sure that the, the, those organizations were were are still eligible to receive funding if there is funding available. Does the, that make sense? It does, okay. um, Vice Mayor. There's only one agency that's identified on the public services sure. that the activity, the way they've proposed it, is not eligible under that funding sure. source. Um, but we did not be able to, we were not able to determine that until we reviewed the application. They presented, you know, their presentation. We asked sure. follow up questions. So sometimes it does get to that point. All of the other activities are generally eligible, but let's talk about 
you know, on the, um, there's a couple on the non-public service, their activity is eligible, but there's some significant concerns of being able to meet regulatory requirements, either the way they've indicated they're going to administer the program or things haven't been done in the correct order that HUD would do it, and it, it puts you at a severe risk starting off at the project. And those notes, I assume, are provided uh, based on the staff's um, review, like technical review of those those items, right? So yes, that is okay, correct, sir. Perfect. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then to my second question was on the reprogram funds. Um, what's is that uh, when, when we have reprogram funds? Is, does that go to the fifteen percent that we have on the CDBG funding, uh, or is that then considered a separate pot or so I'm trying to understand if we get a lot men for one year, but we have uh, funds that are reprogrammed from a previous year, does that in total uh, cap at 15% of the total or is that a, just a different uh, uh, lump sum of money, I guess, that is not considered in the 15% for that year? Is that so uh, no. Mayor Giles, uh, Vice Mayor Council, so it's very tricky. So with the 15%, it's 15% off of the current year allocation. Of the so current year. Okay. anything that's not spent out of that 15% that rolls over to the next year cannot then be reapplied to the next year because it's going to be 15% off that next year's allocation. So no other dollars can ever be reprogrammed back to public services. But you do get, talk oh, about that do. program income. You, yes, okay, cause very Because you, you show the 15% plus. Yes, so the only additional funds that we could receive is if we get program income during, let's say this current year, we mm -hmm. get program income. And that can be, um, say from a rehab program, someone sells their home and they have to pay money back, right? That's program income. So the program income we receive in the current year, for the following year, we can use 15% of that. It's a very small amount. But you'll see we have 21,000 that we sure. received this year, so 15% of that can be used for, for this oh. next coming year, but not the reprogram. So anything reprogrammed ends up going into this other bucket for these bricks and mortar projects. Okay. And, but it, does that then, you, th the entire amount you can spend out for that, the, those reprogram uh, funds, right? Yes, we can spend the reprogram dollars in any program income. It's just where we can spend it sure. so that we don't go over those caps. Okay, that's my question. Thank you. You're very All welcome. right, thank you. I know Ms. Uh, Spilsbury has another question, but before that, any other questions? <clears throat> Julie. Um, I just wanted to speak to the eligibility aspect of it. Um, in talking to staff, the request for child crisis on the non-public service, that is risky. Like there is a good chance that that will be ineligible because of the process that you were saying with the different environmental surveys they needed to get before they started, blah, 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 all those things that we've talked about. That's why I'm not putting my neck out for that one because I don't think it would be super wise for our council to override a recommendation that potentially would be risky. My understanding is the child crisis program in the public services, it was never a matter of eligibility versus ineligibility. It would definitely be eligible. It's just that then if we move money around, I'm hearing from staff that that's where we need to be careful because we have to present all of this to HUD and we're running out of time. Um, these presentations were done December 6th and December 7th. So I'm kind of wondering why does it, what's the three and a half month delay to get to council? Because now that we're running out of time, I'm wondering why we didn't know about this a month ago or two months ago or whatever. Does that, is that just the process that Very takes good that question. long? Yes, so after um, the presentations, the board has approximately four to five weeks to do their scoring and get everything into And there's us. Christmas. I and there's the, the <laughs> holiday breaks. And so <clears throat> then we staff have to go in and average each you know, the score for every single board member and average that out and then do the same. Staff have to score after the agency presentations and then we compile the scores and start the ranking. So it, it does take a couple months for us to get through that entire process with everything else that you know, we're working on as well. Because as a council, we're allowed to make recommendations to change things, but then I'm also hearing maybe it's the time is hard to change things. So I, I'm, a, I'm a little, I'm feeling a little bit conflicted on the information that I'm getting. 
Um, I, I still would like to see how we could fund child crisis something. I didn't get a direct answer on if like 100,000 would help because I understand why would you come up here and say, sure, we'll take 100 over five because you want five. But um, I don't, I don't want to like sit and try to figure out how we can come up with $100,000 for you if that doesn't help your program. I'm assuming you would take 100,000 and you could figure out a way to use it for that program, but anyways, I, yeah. so I, just, I still haven't heard from council if you're sure. open to f looking at how we could figure out how to get them some money and if we're gonna run into HUD problems, so. I'll, I'll respond to that, speaking as one member of our council. Um, <clears throat> I, again, want to respect the, the, the process and the integrity of what's gone into this. I, I think it is, uh, I, I am proud of it and, uh, and I don't want to uh, undermine it. Um, at the same time, I, I do have a, uh, my heart is open to child crisis because we have tried to demonstrate support for child crisis uh, over the last few years. and. Because HUD is a complicated process, it, it hasn't, we haven't been as successful at doing that as we'd like to. So uh, it's kind of a simple reaction, but I mean, I don't want to slice the pie any thinner. I, I'm wondering about making the pie a little bit bigger. Uh, and so currently, the city of Mesa, we are one of just two or three cities in the valley that takes money out of our general fund and allocates it to human services, and I'm proud of that. Uh, Mesa is a very compassionate community, and, and, and that's one of the characteristics that I, I'm most proud of. So currently, under not under the HUD funding, because that, like I say, is complicated, but under the Human Services Funding Request, that is City of Mesa General Fund money and ABC money, uh, from the presentation, we, we contribute $412,000 from our general fund. That's matched with 146 thousand dollars from our utility customers donations takes it out to five hundred and fifty eight thousand dollars and that's the money that's allocated under human services child crisis unfortunately just came very very close but not close enough to get funding under that category they were you know just uh, uh, they got 78 <clears throat> and the ahead of them someone got 80 and they got funded and child crisis didn't so I'm wondering if it wouldn't be less complicated if we said to staff, uh, don't try to, you know, fit this into the HUD, you know, requirements because that's too complicated. But what if, the, if the council expressed to Mr. Brady that uh, our priority is to increase human services funding by a hundred thousand dollars, or round it up from instead of four hundred and twelve thousand, it's five hundred. So that would be another eighty-eight thousand dollars. And if we said to staff. Uh, we want to increase that funding by 88,000 and cap it at a half a million, but then <clears throat> please find another, you know, uh, $12,000 so that we can make an award of <clears throat> $100,000 to child crisis so that we can demonstrate our commitment to the organization and to the expansion of the programs and to the new facility, but not upset the, the apple cart all over, you know, the, create a ripple effect that would, that would defund other agencies. So there, I'll throw that out as a, as a possibility. I'm not asking for an answer now. I'm saying, can staff come back to us in a week or so and say, can you make something like that fit? So, Mayor, can I respond? Yes, please. So, uh, certainly, that's, that is a, a possibility. I think the question I have is, again, do we do it in respect? Again, that would, those were ranked also. Right, yeah. and it's all, and it kind of it's the consideration of how much someone requested and how much they were uh, awarded. And so, at the top of the list, you have someone like House of Refuge requesting eighty-five thousand, and could because they scored the highest, got the eighty-five thousand. Um, and if the scores stay intact, and then we slide down, and certainly by increasing the pot, you could certainly then maybe pick up those who scored at the bottom of the scale. But I guess the question it will raise is for those who um, put in, for example, save the family, 55,000 scored lower, now they're only getting half of what they want. So I'm just presenting to council that creating the pot of dollars is a priority of council. I'm just cautioning what it says to those who scored higher. Yeah. Um, and so is it 100,000 or is it closer to 
25 to 50,000, which is what you know those who are at the the lower end of the score received um, for yeah. that position. So that, I, I just it. throw that out. But if council yeah. says no, irregardless of the pro the score, let's just yeah. put in the money. Then we're really not. I don't need to go back. We just need to say it's this. So. I, I, I totally I appreciate what you're saying, and my response would be. All of that's true, but what it doesn't take into account is the fact that for the last few years, we have unsuccessfully tried to fund child crisis. And because of HUD funding technicalities, it's never, we haven't been successful. So this reflects the, uh, the failed attempt to do this over the, the, the course of a few years to kind of make that right, to, to, to be respectful of the previous funding allocations that were not successful. So, but it, it, and it is absolutely just saying, yeah, we're the city council, we're gonna change and, you know. No, it's just fine. And I guess my point there would be, if the council is going to make that decision, in order maybe to keep, well, all the nonprofits are hearing this conversation, so we're trying to deal with that too. But if it's just, no, just give an allocation of fifty, seventy-five hundred thousand dollars $100,000 to save the family, if that's the question, then let's just do that outside of this process because it. I think the problem with trying to insert it back in here, mm -hmm. it's going to suggest. Well, when you did make your presentations months ago, don't worry. Just wait until this presentation of council every year, yep. and they're just going to line up, and they're and they're here today, and they're gonna, you're going to be having multiple presentations. Every, it, it, we're going to replace the pro the the this process, right? So that, that that makes sense to me as well. And so if again, I'm. I'm handing the issue to you and saying, can you come back to me in a week or so with some options as to how we could demonstrate We this? can certainly do that. Yeah. But I would suggest we're probably not gonna, outside, of, outside this. of this because okay. I think the problem, I really am gonna make a point that that's what we do as professional staff is try to give you processes that you can rely upon and we try to make them so that they're very transparent and giving everybody an opportunity to compete for these very you know, few dollars in a process we can bring to council and say we went through a fair <coughs> process that everybody had a chance to make. Now, there's other priorities in the budget. We say, yeah, that's great, that's one process, but we have this priority and we need it to be addressed and we can address that separately. Thank you. Ms. Spilsbury. Um, <clears throat> another, another thought that I have, which again, anytime you move money around, you're gonna end up affecting other nonprofits. So, and I hate to do that as well. Um, Again, in 2018, when I went and watched that one, they ended up taking 3% off of every other project. Um, so there's always that idea to take a percentage off of projects. Um, an idea I had was that there was three nonprofits in the public services that have two projects each. So an idea I had, because I'm all about fairness, maybe it's because I'm a mom and I'm trying to make everything fair, was that each nonprofit gets one project in that category. And that, so you would take off the, the lower scoring of the second projects of each of those nonprofits, and that way you would have um, around 100,000 to give to child crisis. But then, you know, you, you run the risk of those three nonprofits feeling gypped out too. So I, I don't know that that's a great idea either. That's just an idea I had. And um, just trying to figure out where we could come up with money. And, and I want to make it really clear I'm passionate about this. <clears throat> no way. <laughs> not because, um, I'm sorry, not because um, I've been lobbied by child crisis, but because I care about these foster girls. So if, um, if nonprofits want to come lobby me with, with projects they're passionate about, then bring it on. But I, I want to see these girls get help. It's not because child crisis has been lobbying us and writing us emails. It's because I care about this program, and so I want to see how we can fund it. Thank you. I, I appreciate that, um, and uh, I think I respect that, and I want I, I endorse that, um, Ms. Duff. Um, the the project is um, assisting ten girls, right? Fourteen. That, fourteen. Um, it, in the paperwork I looked up last night, it was fourteen. It was 14. Okay. So it's 14. Okay. But, but a, there are a rotation. Be, we're going to be bringing to you other, we have Arizona 360. We have other foster care programs. I don't want council to think this is your only opportunity. There's, you're going to have one next week or the next time. There's going to be, not to speak against this, but 
there are multiple opportunities to address these issues that we'll be bringing to council. Okay. Also, do we have any money open? I'm trying to figure out on the um, non-public service. Is there any money open there? <laughs> and <clears throat> is there a risk of funding any of that? I mean, um, allocating that to child crisis? So, Mayor Giles, um, members of the um, council, we have 219,000 left right. in the non-public services. But the problem is we can't use those dollars to fund public service activities because then we'll be over our 15% cap. But we could use it as a partial allocation to their application, which is equipping the kitchen, right? Again, there's some serious risks with that okay. project. Okay. Um, as the project is proposed is to purchase equipment with the CDBG dollars and have the labor as donated labor. Um, um, but you can't separate that in a project because then it's the negating the federal requirements of yeah. Davis Bacon and other eligible Okay, so that's activities. the issue on that. Okay, yeah. now I understand. Thank you. All right, I'm going to, again, for Me. just the sake of uh, moving this along, I'm going to propose that uh, we ask that we not act, take action today and that we ask staff to come back with a, uh, a an option for how do we demonstrate support for uh, child crisis in light of the fact that we have not been uh, able to <clears throat> successfully fund them, uh, to, to, to demonstrate the, the support we have for them uh, previously. and. Uh, discontinue this for a week and, and see what other ideas we can And Mayor, can you just clarify? And that's fine. I just, the amount was, what did you say, 75, I'm going to suggest 100,000. 100,000. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Spilsbury. Can I ask, um, can you remind me, how do we decide on the money that comes from the general funds for human services? Is that in our budget mm -hmm. meetings? We yep. go over that amount. And is that... Is there like an increase every year? I just, I can't remember. Or is that kind of the amount we've been doing for 10 years or? I, it's been there for a while. I don't remember the last time. I think we maybe adjusted right before, maybe a couple years ago, or right, I think when we were, I can't remember, I'll have to go back and see. But it's, um, yeah, it's just the amount we try to keep up. It's unique. Um, it and is. frankly, we do try to use that for the smaller nonprofits right. that can't really compete, not compete, but their capacity to manage through the HUD process that gives them an opportunity to kind of pull them out of that because it would be very difficult administratively for some of these to compete in that area. And that's why on, on the human service list, like you go down that, every single one of those projects is amazing. Right. And every nonprofit is doing right. incredible work. So it, I didn't dare mess with that list because it's it's very competitive and it's very hard to be. I, I feel really, really sorry for the staff that has to make the decisions on that list. Okay, I'll take Thank your, you. we'll take your direction. Mr. Freeman has just a comment. one last comment. I think that it just said that, you know, if we were to pull some funding from the public services uh, area, that the nonprofits out there have just heard that there's a potential of taking some funding from them when they've advocated and they've interviewed and, you know, they expect that funding. So I think there's some caution there that, you know, we have to respect the process like the mayor said. and. I'm, I'm just hesitant on moving a lot of funding around because I don't want to complicate everything that we're doing in an already complicated world, and especially the regulations and guidelines that we have to go through. So with that, thank you. Thank you, I agree. Ms. Duff. Quick question, back to the non-public services. So we have a couple hundred thousand left. Do we, re, do we utilize that? Do we take applications again to spend that down? Is there a new opportunity there? So, uh, Mayor and Council, typically with this is a fairly small amount that we have left over, which I'm happy about because we're spending our dollars then. Um, but typically with construction projects, there's always cost overrun. So if there is, we can use those additional dollars for that. Um, otherwise, yeah. we can use it to add to um, any project during the year that might have you know a, an, an issue that needs that. Um, so considering a construction, we need yeah, that construction. Part of contingency for yeah. a good idea. And if not, then it goes uh, reprogrammed for the next year. But I would anticipate we'll probably spend a good portion of it with cost overrun. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank everyone that contributed to this uh, presentation and to everything that led up to the presentation and to the discussion today. I think it's been uh, productive.
And so uh, thank you very much. We'll look forward to, to continuing the conversation. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, next item on our agenda, item two, is to acknowledge receipt of board minutes. Is there a motion to that effect? Thank you, Mr. Freeman and Ms. Spilsbury. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. That passes unanimously. Next is uh, current events and conferences attended. Council members, ha have anything you'd like to share with us? I know I've seen you all being very busy. Ms. Spilsbury. Um, on Tuesday, we some of us got to go tour the new Economic Development Department's office, um, which was super cool. I loved that. Go take a take a visit over there. Um, and then right after that, some of us ran over to the Mesa Police Department's award and promotions and heard some incredible life-saving stories. And that, that's always a neat event to attend. Um, and then yesterday, um, the mayor and um, Council Member Duff and I attended the new Southeast Justice Center grand opening. Um, there's four judges in that facility, so our four different courts, and so our, our different judges are there. It's absolutely beautiful. They were so excited because I guess some of their facilities currently are not very good. So this is a county-run facility, but it, it was really, really neat, and that new courthouse will serve up to 100,000 people every year. So it, it, that was a neat event to attend as well. And then um, just save the date. All of you are going to want to be there on Saturday, April 8th, the day before Easter. We're going to do a big old, yeah, I, I think there's a few Easter um, spring events that day. But in our district, we're doing um, a big spring breakfast. Firefighters will be cooking pancakes, and there will be a petting zoo and bounce house and crafts and an Easter egg hunt. And that's free. Anyone that wants to come, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. on Saturday, April 8th. Thank you. Um, other comments? Ms. Goforth. Yes. Um, last week, you and I attended the ribbon cutting of Cunningham Aviation over at Falcon Field. They're a fixed base operator and providing uh, great services over there, uh, some Jet A and Avgas fueling services, which is uh, much needed. And so it's nice to see that um, investment over at Falcon Field. I went and toured uh, NAMO Defense Systems this week, and uh, they're an important company here in Mesa. They um, produce uh, propulsion technology, and it was a very interesting tour, and um, I appreciated them uh, giving me that tour. In fact, I have a gift for you, Mayor, from them. Ooh, but, right. um, it's not going to blow up, is it? <laughs> no. Um, no, 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 it um, might we get hot. We just had one of those. We just had an explosion. Okay. Yeah. I apologize. I but they no have idea. had some expansion over there at their Mesa location and, and are reinvesting in um, their facilities there, which is great to see. And then Councilmember Duff and I uh, took a helicopter tour of the CAP canal system, and that was fantastic. It was really incredible to see that from the air the scope uh, um, of that infrastructure, and it's obviously a different perspective uh, above it and something I really enjoyed and learned a lot from. So um, we went all the way to Granite Reef Dam uh, in my district, and that was interesting to see how that crosses with SRP, I mean, with the Salt River. So, um, and then went on the, the economic development building tour. Uh, that's a, a really nice new facility. I'm glad that that is, uh, that's a forward facing facility and it's beautiful. They did a great job, so. Yeah. Great. I apologize, I'm, I made an insensitive mark, remark a moment ago about uh, an explosion and that was inappropriate, so uh, I apologize. Um, other comments? Uh, I'll just add, um, sadly, we lost uh, one of our former police chiefs uh, this week. She passed away, Jan Strauss, and I'm excited that that, that happened, frankly, during Women's History Month in Mesa, Arizona, because she is was a very real pioneer and trailblazer in our city. I had the privilege of serving on this council back in 1998 when she became our first woman police chief for the city of Mesa. And she was a remarkable woman, uh, really advanced uh, the cause of women in public service uh, tremendously. And uh, I'm saddened that I'm gonna be out of town this Saturday when uh, her funeral will be uh, conducted. But I uh, wanna express our uh, condolences to Jen and her family. Um, anything else you'd like to share with us, 
Council. Yes, Ms. Goforth. Sorry, I had one more thing. I, I, there is a book donation drive at Red Mountain Library this Saturday from 9 to 12. I wanted to get that out there. So if you have uh, books that you'd like to donate, please go over there. Thank you. All right, thank you. If there's nothing else, Mr. Brady, what is our schedule? I know we're about to really gear up for some serious meetings. Mine is just beginning. Okay. So we will start off on the 30th, this uh, March 30th. We have quite a few presentations to make. So. Great. All right. Well, thanks again. Uh, we appreciate the, the good, all the work that staff is putting in, and we know we're, we're about to embark on some real busy meetings and we're looking forward to that. Uh, if there's nothing else, that, that concludes the agenda for this meeting. Is there a motion to adjourn? Thank you, Ms. Pillsbury and Mr. Summers. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Thank you. We are adjourned. <laughs>